All right. Can everyone see the screen? Yes. Wonderful. See it. Perfect. All right, let's get started. So when Perkins 5 was reauthorized in the uh, summer of 2018, uh, there were many changes, but one of the most significant changes was a new component uh, called the Comprehensive Local Needs Assessment. Um, and with that, first and foremost, a shift from Perkins 4 to Perkins 5 was a more hands-off um, guidance from the Department of Education on the federal level. With Perkins 4, they had been very, very prescriptive and given uh, many FAQs and many guidelines. Um, but with Perkins 5, it was very much a um, flexibility. And of course, with flexibility comes some, some concerns. And so they provided this new component, this local needs assessment, uh, which is part of Section 134, but they didn't really give us a lot of guidance as to how to develop it and how to proceed with it. Uh, within the law, it was that you would, uh, in order to receive the federal Perkins funding, an entity uh, needed to submit a local needs assessment every two years. Um, and that was really really the only guidance that the feds gave uh, beyond that it had to have certain components, um, which was those uh, performance accountability indicators on uh, special population students and subgroups of students, evaluation of the programs based on size, scope and quality, and size, scope and quality was another element that was given a lot of flexibility because we needed to define it, but we weren't given a lot of guidance as to what that meant. And then also an evaluation of the progress towards implementing those CT programs and programs of study. And a program of study is that rigorous connection between secondary into post-secondary. So it's a step beyond just a standard CT program. Then we also needed to look at the recruitment, retention and training of the faculty and staff and how uh, those programs were being implemented with equal access to all students and aligned with business and industry. And so we had many meetings um, over the next several months as we were developing our uh, state plan for Perkins 5 that we submitted and also trying to determine how, how exactly that CLNA was going to look. And one of the major factors with the CLNA um, excuse me, with our Perkins 5 plan was that we were going to work in an alignment with the Department of Employment and Workforce and with the WIOA plan that they had submitted. So while we were not submitting a combined plan, we were sending, submitting a plan um, in alignment where we were bo both walking together, um, being very um, conscientious that our plans were in alignment and that we were walking together uh, down the road for the benefit of South Carolina. And so it seemed very logical that we would go for a regional approach with our CLNA. And so uh, we developed the regional approach where uh, each of the different 12 WIOA regions would submit one local needs assessment. And those regions were comprised of many school districts, at least one technical college, and of course that WIOA uh, workforce board. And in the spring of 2020, despite COVID and all the other fun that was going on, uh, the first round of CLNAs were submitted to the Department of Education. Um, and uh, we, were, um, we were excited, it worked out really well. And about that same time, uh, Ms. Rayford joined our staff and um, we are looking at the 2022 CLNA and how that's going to proceed. Susie? Thank you, Maria. And so what you'll hear from Maria and I today will be an overview of some of the results or outcomes of the uh, Comprehensive Local Needs Assessments or the CLNAs as we all have our education acronyms. And you'll hear it from the state perspective, as well as the perspective from the lower Savannah region. 
So this is um, a graphic uh, picture depicting the lower Savannah region, the counties in the region, school districts, career centers by county, as well as the technical colleges. And um, your lead team members for the Lower Savannah Comprehensive Local Needs Assessment included secondary, or still includes, a team of secondary, post-secondary, and workforce. Um, as a matter of fact, those folks are Joni McDaniel, the Regional Workforce Advisor for your region, Jean Rickenbaker, the Regional Career Specialist, Phyllis Overstreet with Bamberg One, Willett Waring Beatty with Orangeburg Calhoun Technical College, and Carol Kaneki with the Regional Medical Center. So um, the local needs assessment is a regional approach that is not only regional, but it's also secondary and post-secondary together. And so when these were submitted to us back in the spring of 2020, um, we shared them also with our post-secondary counterparts um, at the State Technical College System Office. And one, we'd like to say a thank you to Emily Fox uh, with Academic Affairs over at South Carolina Tech College System uh, for helping us with looking at the uh, statewide alignment and also um, it's just some qualitative um, extractions of the various CLNAs. So one of the things that we realized when we were looking at the labor market on a statewide level was that healthcare uh, and health science programs really were uh, offered at every single region, every single district. Um, and of course, we COVID definitely showed that that uh, industry was definitely going to continue to increase. A little point of interest is back in uh, 20, uh, excuse me, yes, 2006, when Perkins 4 uh, was reauthorized, that's when programs of study were introduced and um, we decided to choose health science as our one program of study statewide for secondary and post-secondary when it came to looking at technical skills assessment uh, because even back then that was the one uh, program the one CTE program that every uh, district and every college offered and so that was definitely a, a an easy pick for that alignment so we were not surprised to see health science was still very much um, an aligned item uh, welding mechatronics hospitality construction all of those high growth industries were represented really well across the state. Also the STEM programs, personal services, because you know we're always going to have need for those, the food prep, engineering, diesel maintenance, um, looking at those logistics. I know COVID definitely illustrated how much uh, those uh, distribution and logistics were always going to be on the forefront for where we're at. Um, and as far as the cosmetology, cybersecurity, all of those things were we, we we were not surprised at all to see how well they aligned across the state. And before we move on, I see that uh, Johnny Murdaugh has his hand raised. Johnny, would you like to come off mute and um, make your comment or ask your question? Sure. If you go back to the slide. Um showing the the uh alignments yes sir Can you uh, see it? one more one more back um down there where you list um the uh career centers one thing you forgot about our little career center at lake mary technology center in orangeburg uh, but also the alignment for calhoun county is the technology center not the coat and the career center correct uh but um we when we first built this because Lake Marion is also a high school, a comprehensive high school was why it wasn't put there, but we will make sure to add it for you, sir. OK, sounds great. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. And so now I'll provide you um, with a little of the regional perspective from the lower Savannah. 
And keep in mind that your Lower Savannah CLNA lead team, they submitted this in 2020 and they were using data available at that time. Um, they actually have their first planning meeting coming up this week, and we'll be looking at everything with a more current lens um, moving into this uh, interim phase where all of the teams across the state are looking at their 2020 CLNA and looking at how they will uh, fill gaps and make improvements by the time we submit the 2022 CLNA. So um, I am just going to highlight a few of these uh, pathways um, from the Lower Savannah region. And this, um, the Lower Savannah region CLNA, CLNA presents these programs that are offered and aligned with labor market reports. Also, the Lower Savannah team demonstrated an excellent best practice by presenting this data in a format that shows evidence of communication and alignment between secondary and post-secondary programming. Um, so manufacturing, let's start there. It is offered in the secondary programs and in post-secondary, it is offered um, by way of several more programs, including mechatronics. And so the secondary wish is to expand um, manufacturing to offer more advanced manufacturing programs like mechatronics, which as they um, as they do that, according to their planning, that will even provide a stronger alignment between um, the districts and the technical colleges. Um, as a matter of fact, in a Lower Savannah Regional Employer Survey, 48% of the respondents stated that their workforce needs aligned with advanced manufacturing cluster, and it is the highest regional employment. 20 of the largest companies are manufacturers, and with an average age of 55 or older, there's an increased need in the next five to 10 years. So this is information that the Lower Savannah team references to um, provide evidence for their um, reporting of data. Um, regarding health science, the um, health science secondary pathways are definitely set up to prepare students for post-secondary. And post-secondary offers a wide range of programs that are actually aligned with the top three occupations in the region, including nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and medical assistance. And education and training is the fifth highest employer by industry in your region. Of the 20 largest employers in the Lower Savannah area, four are school districts or colleges. So that's very impressive and much a need that we need right now. Transportation, distribution, and logistics pathways are offered in secondary and post-secondary, from logistics to automotive technology and truck driving. Very important, and all of those are on the rise, as we well know, currently. Transportation and warehousing are among the top 10 industries with the highest number of employees in your region and still expecting a 22% increase in employment by the year 2026. IT, information technology. Information technology, 21% of industry survey respondents indicated that information technology careers align with their employment needs. Um, in the next four to five years, there's an anticipated 32% increase for these positions in the Lower Savannah region. And one of the regions for that, one of the reasons for that is that one of the top 20 largest employers is a cybersecurity firm. And that's according to the SC Do community profile on the Lower Savannah region. And agriculture. Agribusiness is South Carolina's largest economic sector. 
contributing to nearly $42 billion and over 200,000 jobs to the state's economy. And that's, um, the, and the lower Savannah region is one of the largest agricultural areas in the state. So that is um, attributed to the success in the agricultural programs. And so back over to you, Maria. So when they looked at the labor market um, and when it says here offered, um, not offered, but needed, um, a lot of times when they say not offered, it's, it's meaning they're not offered at the post-secondary or that seamless connection isn't there. Um, and so this is more of the post-secondary looking at where their needs are to become aligned with that labor market that, as uh, Susie just talked about, uh, was really needed. For instance, those um, transportation logistics, the CDL drivers, uh, HVAC, uh, the diesel, of course, to work with that transportation field, renewable energy, um, and as far as the computer repair installation, veterinary science. So these are the programs that are needed in the area, but are perhaps not aligned fully between secondary and post-secondary. And so this is a very good conversation launching point uh, for the um, for the secondary and post-secondaries to sit down together uh, for 2022 across the state and decide uh, how they can best address those needs for business and industry that uh, are currently not um, being filled fully. Susie? Yes, looking for that mute button sometimes. Um, and so as it um, drills down to the lower Savannah region, the analysis of labor market information shows um, these programs that are not offered, but needed according to um, the growing need for a workforce pipeline in these areas. Um, earlier, I mentioned uh, the need for mechatronics and the expansion of advanced manufacturing in secondary programming. And as I mentioned, the employer surveys, 48% uh, of the employers surveyed stated their workforce needs are aligned with advanced manufacturing and mechatronics. In the secondary arena, career exploration opportunities in this area um, can improve student interests. Uh, according to the student survey, only about 4% of the respondents indicated that a manufacturing career was their number one interest. So we do need to get out there and promote these, the wide range of career opportunities in these nice, clean, beautiful, modern factories and modern um, facilities that are available across our state and especially in the lower Savannah region. Regarding health science, um, secondary, wants to expand to include pre-nuclear health physics. And that is in response to uh, business and industry needs because those programs can prepare students to fill the workforce pipeline for the Savannah River Nuclear Solutions Company. And their top employer needs right now are technicians. By way of post-secondary, Orangeburg Calhoun Technical College reported the Manufacturers Council initiated plans for a new HVAC program. You can see the HVAC has been a gap in the past for them. And they um, that dealers and heavy equipment companies have initiated a plan for new programs in medium and heavy diesel, as you see mentioned here. And they're also listening to their students' requests, as well as the local hospital in planning for expanding EMT offerings. These business and industry collaborations in an advisory capacity serve as an excellent best practice in the collaborative efforts that the Lower Savannah region has in secondary and post-secondary, along with business and industry. Maria? Thank you so much. 
So another vital component of the local needs assessment is the analysis of student performance. And so the indicators for performance on the secondary level and post-secondary level were evaluated and we looked at the statewide uh, indicators. Now for the 2020 CLNA, we it was first of all, it was what we call a by year. It was our transition year. Uh, the 1920 school year was a transition year from Perkins 4 to Perkins 5. 2021-21 will be is the first let me start over again. In December of 21, we will submit a consolidated annual report to the Department of Education. And in that, we will report our indicator, our student performance. For the December 2020 report, it was a by year, so we did not report any of our performance levels, but we did collect it. And in that, we look at those um, alignment with the graduation rate, the um, English and math. Uh, for Perkins 5, we added the uh, science skills, uh, post-secondary placement, non-traditional program, which are those programs that have 25% uh, of the other gender. One nice thing with Perkins 5 is in Perkins 4, we had to report on not only enrollment, but also completion for those non-traditional programs. And it really was a, um, it was a gap then. And it still is a gap across the nation um, because nationwide, it's still just that 25% of students for, for whatever reason or the other. And it always does provide an opportunity to evaluate um, how to encourage students of the other gender to participate. So for instance, uh, the female in welding uh, versus the um, male in early ed education. So when we looked at the reports that for student performance, and these would be for secondary, the data that's currently in a power school, and in post-secondary, it's the data that they pull out of iPads. Looking across the state on the secondary level, two areas of significant strength were 1S1, which is our four year graduation rate. And we do all know that CTE students really just hit it out of the ballpark. We are a good 15% higher than uh, the standard graduation rate with our CTE programs. Uh, our students really are um, just going places um, exponentially wonderfully. And the other great strength was post-secondary placement because we know that the CTE gets those jobs. So not only do we, we place them in uh, the military or in post-secondary education, but we get them placement in jobs. So we really are the pipeline for success for those students. Now, when we look at thinking about the um, reporting that we'll do in December for the state level, looking at the um, 2S1, 2S2, and 2S3, which are those English, math, and science. Because of the waivers that the Department of Education provided because of COVID, um, we're not sure. So it's not really a weakness. We just, it's kind of an unknown right now. Um, again, we know with the post-secondary placement, we're gonna hit it out of the park. 4S1, it's, it's always, it's a national gap even without COVID um, and that doesn't mean we don't pass all of our indicators as a state. We really do, but it is one that's a, it's a little bit tighter than the graduation rate and post-secondary placement. And then we have some new uh, indicators, uh, which is the 5S1, 5S2, and 5S3, which are your certifications and credentials, dual credit, and work-based learning. And those are brand new for Perkins 5. And so um, not really a strength or a gap yet. We're just really waiting to see how they're looking. Uh, with uh, COVID last spring, you know, things were just a little bit different. So those are kind of up in the air right now. So they're not a strength or a, ga or a gap. It's more of a, we're just looking at the numbers and thinking about it a little bit. But statewide, with hands down, the graduation rate and that placement uh, we with CTE um, really knocked that out of the ballpark and um, 
So that that was that was not a surprise when we ran the numbers on that. And then with the lower Savannah region, I'll hand it over. Um, Susie, I'll talk about that. But as I mentioned earlier, these right here are our unknowns. Um, and just trying to figure out how that's going to look. We're just not sure yet. Um, with the 2S1, 2, and 3, um, not only do we have the waivers last spring, but they also are changing some of the testing for that. And I know that some of you remember when we switched from ASAP, uh, HSAP to the, um, the different testing mechanisms, we had a little bit of hiccup that year. So we're, like I said, we're kind of waiting to see how it's going to pan out um, for this next reporting period. Susie? And here we have uh, the lower Savannah region, uh, strengths and you'll see one of the gaps here. So an analysis of student performance, you'll see that the lower Savannah exceeded the statewide indicators for the top three listed here, 1S1, 2S2, and 2S3. And the remaining third, they still actually met the student performance indicators for, um, for those three. Uh, working um, with 3S1, uh, they actually stated that they're working to strengthen their pathways with the technical colleges to improve non-traditional program enroll, um, I'm sorry, post-secondary placement. And also for 4S1 and 5S1, they stated that they would be working on baselines for improvements for both of those indicators for this, uh, for this time period during the improvement phase of the um, CLNA. And you see um, the gap here as well, academic proficiency in reading and language arts, which they are working on some team approaches to be able to uh, bring those numbers up as well. And when you see Maria and hear Maria and I delivering this information and talking about gaps, we have been working together across the state with each of the 12 regions offering best practices, strategies, and techniques to uh, narrow these gaps. And we compiled this information in some documents that you'll see shortly that will help all 12 regions it, uh, make their own improvements, so. Absolutely. All right. Then the third element for the CLNA that's uh, required is an analysis of programs and looking to see um, how the programs are, uh, where uh, they could be strengthened, what could be done to strengthen not only the program, but the alignment uh, between post-secondary, secondary, and just, um, a, a, just a deep dive, honest look at, at the programs being offered and statewide, uh, need for CTE faculty. That's across the board. And not only that, but making sure that they are funded and provided the, the professional development that they need to um, succeed in the classroom. Funding new programs. Um, the world is changing exponentially, and there are programs we know now that weren't there five years ago, and there'll be even more. Alignment between the secondary and post secondary is not only for programs of study, but that career pathway in general. Scheduling issues, um, and that is, I know, a big, um, big concern between the career centers and the high schools and just making sure that the students have all the opportunities for success they need, whether they're a student athlete or a band student or just a student who needs to go to the, the career center and then how to get the student there. Transportation, transportation issues uh, always um, will be there for students and, and that's one thing that's, that's really great is that uh, the, the federal Perkins funds can work with those special population students for transportation. So there are, there are a lot of possibilities there that weren't there 10 years ago. Work-based learning opportunities are always um, going to be um, 
high on the need. And especially because South Carolina has such a large rural area, you know, making sure that we truly are giving students everything they need for those work based learning opportunities and making sure that we can um, give them that exposure and that experience. And from that also those industry relationships so that even the mom and pop shops have that relationship with the school districts with the students so that they can have those opportunities and then fundamentally equal access and equity equity for all students. That is the the core of everything that we do uh, with CTE with education, just making sure that all students have the same opportunities. And Maria, we yes, have another question from Johnny Murdoch. Johnny, yes, would you like to come off mute? Yes, actually I had two um, uh, questions or, or and I guess it'll go into the recommendations. One, and I'm probably showing my age, back when the, um, the program of study and the requirements for 1S1 and 1S2 for math and science were put in place, High schools that work created that cohort where they had um, integration of math and science, math and ELA into career tests, career um, programs um, in service for teachers. Are we going to go back to requesting that service occur again for for our other ones? And the second thing is because of the work based learning, it has been stagnant for a couple of years. And I know we got to get our numbers up. But because we are rural areas and the requirements for getting transportation and all that stuff, would there be opportunity for the state to request an increase in work based learning for career centers? And that's with it. The, with the federal Perkins funding, the, alloc the allocation is based on census data. So it's it's really not as flexible. State level, we, we continually ask. Yes, sir. Um, for that and uh, we have some some great ideas on the horizon for work based learning. We are working on them as far as the integration with the math and English into the curriculum. The high schools that work funding is part of that EIA and it is definitely there. We will not at the at this moment uh, focus on a new cohort through Perkins funding. But it is very possible with our relationship with high, uh, with SREB that that is on the horizon. Um, and so we are looking into it, um, but it, we don't have it in place at this moment. Um, but we do totally acknowledge that uh, that support mechanism for the faculty uh, is there and we need to make sure that we are supporting them fully. Susie, would you like to discuss the recommendations? Sure. And that answer your question, Johnny? Yes, it did. Yes, it did. OK, great. Thank you. Thank you. And in follow up to um, Maria's demonstration of the analysis of programs, I just wanted to uh, make another acknowledgement for the region because there are some industry involvement in programming that you do, and it was evident in the Lower Savannah CLNA. In secondary, the survey data um, programs to fill industry needs, uh, they survey industry to fill industry needs, and the technical colleges as well. Enrollment is monitored with industry feedback, graduation and placement rates in post-secondary, help them determine whether or not to cycle in or out different programming. And uh, transportation for secondary students is a great plus for your region and, um, and also preparing them to attend post-secondary programs in that area. Because that is one of the gaps that bubbled up in programming in several places across the state is that transportation distribution, logistics, warehousing piece. And so um, y'all are a little ahead of the game when it comes to that one. And so now I'll move on to some um, general recommendations that we've talked about. And uh, for one, beginning those conversations and planning with the regional team in the spring to prepare for fall implementation. And that's happening now. 
The 12 regional uh, CLNA teams across the state are scheduling and planning and holding their team meetings, looking at uh, the 2020 CLNA, looking at the resources and everything available to them through all of the research that everyone involved has done and provided. So, um, so that is the first step, is getting into those planning meetings. Then using the 2020 CLNA to guide your activities, but providing updated information and labor market sources at the same time. Uh, because the labor market looks a lot different than it did prior to submitting the 2020 CLNA. One of the nice sources that has come up recently is provided by the Department of Commerce and the Regional Workforce Advisors. It is um, a snapshot, a quarterly snapshot that is provided. And so that will give those teams a really current, current lens of labor market aligned with education um, as they move forward in their planning stages. And also relying on other strengths to identify best practices and to close gaps. I mentioned it in a couple of different ways already, but we have received through our CLNA regional meetings, best practices from each of the regions that we have compiled into a document that is called the uh, South Carolina CLNA Improvement Phase Toolkit. And you're familiar with these types of documents. They're full of resource links uh, to provide everyone across the state with the, um, the opportunity to be updated on that information. I think I missed one point on the last slide. Yes, and uh, this will be covered on the next slide too. Making sure that these teams refer to the CLNA focus group updates and the Office of Career Technology Ed websites for resources. And all of you can refer to that information for resources. So um, recently, uh, last month for the first, uh, for the first month, no, the month of February, we pulled together a comprehensive local needs assessment focus group. So we have representation of secondary, post-secondary and workforce representatives that have come together on a, um, every other month. And we are looking at the planning process and bringing other people to the table and recommendations for the improvement phase for the CLNA planning meetings. For example, one of the things that bubbled up during the process is uh, prerequisites in middle school and how are those leading uh, and preparing students for high school CTE programming. So we have provided some resources that each of the teams can use to look into uh, their processes for middle school prerequisites. Another point that has come up is the uh, communication between CTE, between the um, IEP administrators and school counselors and career specialists. And so how can everybody get together and communicate so that um, the students are placed appropriately with, with, um, with equal access to all students? And just that communication about what are the prerequisites and expectations of certain CTE courses. So school counselors need to be coming to the table as well. So any of you out there that are interested, you can get in contact with your um, CLNA team. So we also have been updating the Office of Career and Technical Education CLNA website and you can see the link there. You'll be able to click on that and have access to it when you receive a copy of this PowerPoint. And the newest uh, website that we have is a business and industry website. The business and industry website is actually for a business and industry audience, though you can also use this website to pull information as you're communicating about South Carolina CTE 
to prospective business partners or current business partners in your region. There are articles there about how business and industry can engage with CTE, as well as uh, articles that will um, give them more knowledge about CTE, as well as information about uh, CTE during COVID and how CTE is a way to build skills in students and prepare them for um, the future workforce. Susie, we do have a hands up. Uh, Hydric Glass has has a hand up. Um, would you like to come off mute and speak? Yes, I would. Um, and that's Gas G A S. I'm so sorry. Excuse me, yes, sir. That's all right. Uh, you know, the first thing I like to say is I just want to thank you for uh, just mentioning that 15% higher than standard graduating rate from the CTE students and the post-secondary placement. You know, that's cannot be said loud enough or <laughs> long enough because the data has been saying that for years, but yet there seem to be a lot of people that haven't heard it. So every time I hear it, I just want to just shout. So thank you for that. The other thing I want to do is just echo what uh, Dr. Murder said about the ELA placement and math placement in the, uh, in the Kate centers because uh, I was there when it was here and I'm here now that it's gone. And I remember how great it was to be able to, as an example, uh, look over somebody's portfolio and be able to send them right over to an ELA teacher and say, hey, you know, uh, can you work with them on that or get with a math teacher on something else? So that was great. The question that I have, and you may have answered it, but um, on a CLNA team, are there any teachers that are, are represented on that team? Because, you know, we're on the front lines, we're sitting in the foxholes and we're getting direct fire. So we we have we know a lot of what's going on. So I see you shaking your head. Is, is that a yes? And I was going to, Susie, if I could speak on this. Um, one of the fundamental aspects of the local needs assessment is everyone's voice, whether it's the student, the administrator, the parent, and most definitely the teacher. And so please do step forward. Uh, if you want to reach out, Susie can put you in touch with your um, regional team. We would love to have faculty voices on that that um, that team. So yes, sir, uh, it is a component, and we would welcome opportunities to hear um, all voices. I would be extremely interested in that. I'm um, excited about teaching, and I, and I, I just I always feel that teacher representation is. Uh, at a minimal when it should be more. I'm not criticizing or judging people. I'm just I just want people to to just uh, just. Ask us and get our input because uh, there's a lot of things that we can uh, give that are important and needed that some people don't necessarily see because they're not right there experiencing it. Experiencing it. And I also wanted to follow up the comment about the math and science when it shifted from Perkins three to Perkins four. It was a mindset shift, and that's where they moved away from that integration. And so moving to Perkins 5, they're they're coming back around um, close, focusing more on the special populations and that integration and understanding how you have to scaffold that framework of learning for the students. So I, I definitely think that you're going to see some changes. It's just um, with last year being the transition year and then COVID-19 hitting, um, it, it was kind of that perfect storm, so we had to step back, punt, and look at the virtual learning and those elements, but um, we're, we're, we're definitely making that progress. So uh, please keep your, your pom-poms and your voice loud in here because we do want to hear you, sir. We want to know uh, what's going on, and I used to be, a, I was a classroom teacher as well, and I totally and completely agree and understand. Thank you. Thank you, sir. And Colonel Leonard, you had your hand up? Yes. Uh I guess we're going to have to put an asterisk by the year uh, 2021. And the I, reason I say that, you know, we've been shown, you know, the data that's been gathered the last year or two, two couple of years. But, you know, as we all know, this year, our completer rates will go down. Our failure rates are going up. And it's not all because of how we do business. It's just the way it happened this year with students. So I, I, I don't, you know, want to, to be the, the the sour apple in this barrel here, but we've got to be realistic. And so when we go to these 
uh, meetings and, we, and, to, and the prospects of employers and stuff, you know, they got to understand that, you know, there's going to be a dip this year for 2021. And uh, so I know it's going to skew the data, but I think everybody just got to be realistic in, about that. That's, that's what I'm trying to say. And we've we've definitely looked at it and had that conversation. Um, the feds uh, reached out and talked about, do we need to look at our um, our percentage of success with our indicators? And we really did crunch a lot of numbers and 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 think about it. And you're and you're right. This is definitely a a asterisk kind of year, but um, but we'll we'll be okay. But I you know I think that I think that while there is some definite hiccups going on all in all as a state we've we've done OK. So um, I think as long as we keep the nose to the grind and, and, and keep the eye on the kids and, and where they're going, we'll get there one day at a time. <laughs> but yes, sir. All right, and I'm going to share our contact information with you all. Susie, I'm going to hand it back to you. OK, thanks everybody for your comments and um, and Mr. Gass, I really appreciate your uh, willing to commit willingness to commit to being a part of the CLNA lead team. Um, please know that in the um, that in the full document of the Lower Savannah CLNA and all of the 12 CLNAs, there were teachers listed as stakeholders, so they did have an opportunity to uh, to review the CLNA and give any recommendations or comments. But I do think that having someone at the table for the regular planning meetings would be um, would probably be welcome. Y'all have a small group right now. There there are only like four people on the team. So um, if you want to send me an email. You see my email address right there. I'll be happy to connect you with the lead facilitator, Joni McDaniels, and um, hopefully you can even join us this coming, I believe it's Wednesday, for the first planning team meeting. Thank you. Sure. And we will be sharing this presentation with uh, Dr. Lemon to share with all of you. Um, we just very much appreciate your time today joining us, uh, your interest in the local needs assessment. Uh, again, it is required in order to receive funding uh, to participate, but you guys have knocked it out of the park. I mean, Susie mentioned it. Lower Savannah, you guys really, truly solved the objective. You stepped up to the to the to the plate and hit, hit it out of the park. And uh, we thank you for your dedication to the students and your community and the states. Um, Dr. Murdahl. I just have one question. Um, one of the difficulties, because uh, I, I was uh, Colonel and I also served on that committee, is that our region has three different hubs. What I mean by that, Aiken, Orangeburg, Allendale. So you have three, actually four technical colleges serving our particular region, which kind of skews the data because Orangeburg does not look like Aiken. Um, and is and it does look like Allendale, but but our 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 data is um, actually um, what you call it, skewed or or actually averaged between the three. Is there a way that we can look at? And that's something I'll talk with Joni about as well. Is looking at focusing on the the, the hubs in their areas and then combining the data so that it won't just look like you know our entire region when we have you know we have polar opposites between the huge thriving community of Aiken growing community of Orangeburg and settled um, community of Allendale all in the same picture. Well and, and that's one of the one of the, the elements of a regional approach for instance um, Ori, Georgetown and Williamsburg um, the each of the regions does have that interesting approach and so yes look at your local data and then look at the regional data and then look at the statewide data and um, Susie and I are working right now in order to build uh, an application that for the for the CLNA for 2022 and part of that is allowing that multi-tiered 
analysis because yes, the regions are very much um, divergent and that's okay. Um, and we understand that we are not judging uh, a region um, and we definitely want you to look at it um, on that local level and then step up, but it is um, just part of the, the picture of the state. Um, and the state is very diverse. Greenville is definitely very different from Williamsburg. It's just the nature of our state and that's OK, but we will definitely be looking at your local data, the regional data and then the state level data. OK. Susie. I think in re in response to Dr. Murdaugh as well, um, there, there is representation from more than one technical college specifically mentioned in the CLNA, so you may be right, and that may be a recommendation for the um, for the team is to look at uh, all of the technical colleges and make sure that they're all mentioned. As a matter of fact, as Maria mentioned, we're working on the development of the 2022 um, needs assessment uh, format and one of the things that the new platform will provide is a specific section for each technical college within a region. So Aiken Technical College would have their own section and uh, Orangeburg Calhoun would have their own section and so forth. Each one of the school districts will have their own section as well and that data will be there for until the internet breaks because we'll be holding that and um, it will be available to the public when we are um, when we're able to deliver this on the platform that we're working with now with the um, IT at the State Department of Ed. So thank you for those um, for those comments and your perspective. Thank you all so very much for joining us today. Uh, again, we appreciate your time. Uh, we will send this presentation to Dr. Lemon to disperse. I think you already have it, sir. Um, I, do. Um, I do. Very good. But just thank you very much for the invitation and for allowing us to join you today. We very much appreciate it. Um, and you guys, Susie is just, she's got this. She's going to lead us through <laughs> the next steps. It's going to be good. Um, so thank you all, um, Mr. Glass. And there's another hand. Mr. Glass. Yeah, I'm sorry, but I, I have to say this one more thing that I wanted to add, and it, it kind of uh, what generated these thoughts was that I was listening to uh, Mr. Richard Leonard speak, and he was talking about the asterisk. And one of the things that you don't hear often, but in a sense, and this is just an, another aspect, another viewpoint, uh, COVID was, in, was a blessing in disguise. And what I mean by that is that there are many deficiencies that existed all along. And when COVID came along, it just brought them closer up so that we could see them. And, and we can see how so many communities, particularly in the uh, rural areas, were really marginalized because of lack of equipment, the lack of uh, internet, and other things that we all know that they're, they're missing and needing. So now that they're, they're here and close up and right where we can see it, this is an opportunity to uh, address those issues and try to level the playing field so that all of our students can have access and have quality equipment and, and be able to uh, get the same things that, that other areas are getting or they've already had for years and years. I will give you an amen on that, sir. Absolutely. Right. Absolutely. Thank you all. Thank you all so much. Have an amazing day, an amazing after, um, afternoon, an amazing week, and um, just take care of yourselves out there, everybody. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day. Thank you. 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 Thank you.